Welcome to Forensic DNA. This is the second topic of Module 4. We will begin by discussing the structure of DNA and then the differences between nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. We will begin by discussing the basic DNA terminology, which will then allow us to discuss two different techniques that are commonly conducted in forensic laboratories in the analysis of DNA, RFLP and PCR. Finally, we will discuss the database which is used for DNA samples. DNA is the abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. This is the building block for an individual's genetic makeup. A person's DNA is in the same in every living cell, so DNA extracted from blood, saliva, skin, semen will all test the same for an individual. It is composed of four building blocks called nucleotides. A nucleotide is composed of a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. These nucleotides differ in the type of base that they contain. There are two purine-based nucleotides and also two pyrimidine-based nucleotides. The nucleotides are bound together covalently by the phosphoester linkage between carbons. This forms one side of the DNA strand. Two strands combine to form the DNA structure. Adenine always binds with thymine and cytosine always binds with guanine. The sequence of the bases can differ, though, along the order of the backbone. So exactly where is DNA found? DNA is in every living cell, so when we think about biological evidence, we think of blood, skin, saliva, semen, and hair samples predominantly. Nuclear DNA is packed into chromosomes within the nucleus of a cell. Each nucleus contains 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs of which one is donated by the father and one is donated from the mother. There is also mitochondrial DNA which is located within the chromosomes in the mitochondria of a cell. All mitochondrial DNA is donated by the mother, so this means that every descendant from a woman would have similar mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA have several things in common. The chromosomes have specific areas which contain coding and non-coding regions. The coding regions determine the traits for an individual. So the coding regions may be for their actual gender, their hair color, their eye color, different characteristics that the person has. Non-coding areas are generally utilized for the DNA testing. A locus or loci is the actual location of the gene on a region of the chromosome. An allele is a form of the gene at that particular locus. The combination of alleles at a particular loci is called a genotype. Some alleles may be found in multiple forms or have various combinations and these are called polymorphisms. Sequence polymorphism variation can be generated within the four nucleotides even within a short DNA fragment. Sequence polymorphisms are areas of the DNA strand that are exactly the same except at one location. 
Sequence length repeats can also be generated with the four nucleotides within a DNA fragment. Length polymorphisms are areas which repeat a specific sequence. When the repeats occur right next to each other, they are called tandem repeats. When there is variation from individual to individual in the number of repeats, this is called variable number of tandem repeats. It is the polymorphisms or the unique order of these four base units that the forensic scientist takes advantage of to conduct DNA analysis. An example of this is located at cro cro chromosome 11. The location or the loci TH01 has a repeating sequence of adenine, adenine, thionine, and guanine. Everyone has chromosome 11, and everyone has this repeating sequence. However, individuals will have the different number of repeats of this sequence. The repeats can be anywhere from 3 to 14 repeats. So person 1 may have 10 repeats at this location, where person 2 may have 13. The variation of genotypes at multiple locations is the basis for the DNA identity testing. If we think about dice and we roll a dice to see how many times you can obtain the number 6, this would be using one dice one out of six times. If you use two dice, it would be one out of six added to one out of six. This is what the basis of forensic identity testing is done. Using population genetics to determine the frequency of each genotype found, a DNA analyst can obtain very high statistical results with DNA testing. All biological evidence can be subjected to DNA testing. It just depends on which type of DNA, whether it would be nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. Nuclear DNA can be formed by two different methods, RFLP or PCR combined with STR. RFLP requires a larger size sample, as you can see by this example, where PCR testing can use just a, a sample the size of a small pinhead. RFLP was used into the mid to late 1990s. With RFLP typing, a DNA sample is broken into pieces by restriction enzymes. The areas our base repeats are examined. These are called variable number of tandem repeats. The restriction fractions are separated by using gel electrophoresis. If you remember, electrophoresis is going to separate the fragments by moving negatively charged DNA through a gel with a current your smaller DNA is going to move faster than the larger DNA fragments. The samples are then visualized through a process called slot blotting. This visualization is done by transferring the segmented DNA to a nylon membrane and then subjecting it to a probe. The probe actually marks specific areas of complementary repeating units. These areas can then be detected by an x-ray film or through chemiluminescence. The DNA samples can then be compared from an unknown stain to known samples. Since RFLP cuts the DNA into larger segments, samples cannot be as easily multiplied, which meant that the samples 
had to be larger to obtain results. Because of the samples being larger, they also tended to degrade a little bit more quickly. Because of this, PCR and SDRs have become the preferred method for DNA testing in forensic laboratories. PCR combined with SDR goes through three different steps. The PCR and the DNA sample is denatured, which bonds holding base pairs breaking apart, resulting in single strands of DNA. Then it goes through an annealing process and an extension through the use of a thermocycler. So initially, the samples are going to be denatured and broken into pieces by heating at approximately 94 degrees centigrade. Next, a primer is going to be added to the marked areas of addition of new bases so that the exposed bases can be paired with a complementary base which ultimately extends the DNA. This process is done at a temperature of approximately 60 degrees so that the bases will bind. Then a DNA polymerase enzyme is added so that that extension can actually occur. This completes one cycle. The process is repeated typically 28 to 32 times to produce enough DNA copies so that SDR typing can be performed. Usually this yields approximately 1 billion copies and it takes less than 3 hours. SDRs are run on capillary electrophoresis. This separates the fragments by moving negatively charged DNA through a capillary column with a current. The smaller DNA fragments are going to move faster than the larger DNA fragments. The SDRs examine specific areas of base repeats. Typically, the base repeats are done and examined at 13 different locations. This is an example of STR data. The profile of each STR region appears as either one or two peaks. The size of the peak, or the height of the peak, actually represents the number of times that the STR is repeated for that particular person. For example, at the the photo that's the example on the right hand side of this slide, STR is repeated 14 times on chromosome 3 at this particular site and it is also repeated 17 times on the other chromosome 3. Remember that chromosomes in humans occur in pairs. Each of the locus are examined and then the probability of the identification is established from published population studies. If we look at this four locus example, the probability would be 0.15 times 0.29 times 0 0.07 times 0 0.049 which ultimately would give us one person in 6,666 individuals that would have this combination of alleles at this loci. So when using 13 loci, the statistical numbers obtained are usually in the billion or trillion range. Since the population of the United States is slightly more than 30 million, the chance of two individuals having the same genotypes at the 13 loci is extremely remote. SDR samples can be easily multiplied because it takes such a smaller sample. They also tend to degrade less quickly because of this size. 
mitochondrial DNA may be necessary for some samples. Mitochondrial DNA is also performed by PCR, and the sequencing is done for two regions within the DNA. Because of this, the statistics are not as great as with the PCR STR, which can be done on the nuclear DNA. There is a database that analysts can take advantage of with DNA samples. CODIS stands for the Combined DNA Index System, and this is a database that administ is min administered by the FBI. This database enables local, state, and national forensic laboratories to exchange and compare DNA profiles. It utilizes two different databases, one which is a convicted offender file in which DNA profiles are stored from individuals convicted of certain crimes. The second database is a forensic file which contains DNA profiles from various crime scene evidence. Its main use is to help identify samples from a crime scene when there is no suspect listed. When matching to a convicted offender that's actually in the database, this allows the officer to obtain a search warrant for a sample from that individual. When matching a forensic file, several case investigations may also be able to be linked. While CODIS has its great advantages to investigations, it also has some limitations to be aware of. Not all convicted offenders may go through facilities that actually obtain samples, so there may be some offenders that are actually not included in the database. Because of laboratory caseloads, samples may have a time frame that they may or may not be contained within that database. And also, some agencies may have restrictions on the number of case samples that can actually be run, once again limiting samples that are entered into that database. Biological evidence has also been used in other legal situations besides ongoing investigations. It has also been used in many cold case reviews and also post-conviction investigations. In cold cases, DNA has been admitted as evidence in criminal courts in states at times, depending on the statute of limitations. However, now with the availability of DNA, a lot of the states are changing laws so that they have eliminated the statute of limitations on certain crimes, making the availability of DNA analysis possible. There is also the possibility of using DNA analysis to provide conclusive results in cases where previous testing had been inconclusive. Because of this fact, post-conviction DNA testing is be, being re requested on numerous cases. So exactly what does it mean when DNA is admitted as evidence in a criminal case? A forensic DNA profile is the combination of the individual genotype of all DNA markers that have been analyzed. Once that forensic DNA profile has been obtained from a sample, comparisons can be made with other samples either from a crime scene or from a known individual. Reports are usually listed so that the DNA sample may be contained as an inclusion an exclusion, or in some instances, the sample may be inconclusive or there may be no results. 
Results that are listed as an inclusion may also provide statistical information. This is obtained by using random match probabilities. Random match probabilities are determined from DNA bases, databases profiling containing major racial and ethnic groups. The rarity of genotype frequency is determined by the allele frequencies. So product rule is then applied giving a final statistical number.